Hello, uh, this is Frankel Webner. I'm making a video this time about Michael Chekhov. Well, he's the uh, main focus, but there's going to be a lot of stuff re that I'm relating to Michael Chekhov. From the title of this video is uh, Michael Chekhov Gestalt Kabbalah. Unless I change my mind, of course, then it might have a different title, but so far that's my plan. And uh, it's, I don't have a, a definite clear-cut agenda here. This thing might go on a, a long time because this is a very big project. Um, my, the, the material I want to use from Michael Chekhov is the five hours uh, that he recorded the same year he died, in 1955. I'm so grateful I found it on the internet. And uh, I did a lot of work, and here's my handwritten copy. I'll be using this, so you, you can get used to my, uh, my nice orange uh, highlighter. Um, helps me keep get my bearings here. Another thing that will help me get my bearings is uh, this is a one-page summary of the sections of the thing. I have it divided into ten sections. Um, and I'll be using other sources too. But uh, this the topic here is so so huge that uh, it's a, I think it's very important, especially at the beginning, to zero in on something very specific, to get to get to the heart of the matter right away. So even though it's I'm sure it's a controversial statement, uh, it's uh, my treatment of this of Michael Chekhov is very different than anything I've seen anyone else doing on the internet. I'm just going to jump right in and say in one sentence uh, one of my first major conclusions, and that is that Michael Chekhov uh, basically says to an actor when you, uh, when you look at a script, when you look at a play, uh, treat it as, the, uh, as, a, if you were, as though you were a gestalt therapy client and you're, uh, you're doing some dream work. Because the procedure is basically uh, very similar. Now, I'm not going to get into all the historical uh, minutia about wh wh who learned, who, who got it from who. It's interesting that the most, certain things, are just, just, just before I get started, a couple little interesting footnotes here that everybody involved in this, in my uh, essay here practically, is Jewish. Uh, on the other hand, <laughs> most of them don't want to do it, have anything to do with Judaism, Michael Chekhov included. Uh, I never knew he was Jewish for, until I looked on the internet and read his biography and found out that his mother was Jewish. So that makes him <laughs> Jewish whether he likes it or not. And Fritz Perls, uh, the only thing Jewish about Fritz Perls, as far as I know, is he liked to make jokes, jokes about Jewish mothers and stuff like that and use occasionally a Jew Yiddish word. Um, but some of the other people involved here, uh, uh, I'll be dealing with Meisner. Sanford Meisner, and uh, Lee Brewer from Amber Mines Theater Company. And then I'm going to relate this all, all this stuff, oh, but not to mention, very important, the Walter Benjamin. And I'm going to be relating it to Kabbalah along the way, especially uh, the Breslauer, uh, Nachman of Breslauer's Kabbalah, Nach Nachman of Breslauer. Nachman of Breslov's Kabbalah, and also the Chabad Kabbalah, especially at the beginning, is an amazing parallel between the Chabad uh, Tanya book and uh, Michael Chekhov. Um, but anyway, in this particular video, the first one, the focus is going to be, the first hour or so, the first focus is going to be primarily on Gestalt therapy, looking for some very obvious parallels here. Amazing how obvious they are. Um, I think Michael Chekhov got to the United States sometime around 1940, and uh, Fritz Perls uh, got to the United States after the war, after World War II, so that makes him in, in, in somewhere in Los Angeles, maybe, or New York, 1950. 
So it's possible that Fritz Perl's got some of this stuff from Michael Chekhov, or he might have got it from uh, some other theater people he might have worked with back in, uh, in Germany before he left. I don't know. I, I don't have to know. I just, I'm looking at the data here, and I see amazing uh, parallels. Okay, so I want to show you that, first of all. Um, but I first need to say to some people that don't know what gestalt therapy dream work is, um, I have to just quickly give you an example. All right? I'm just going to make up a simple example here, the simplest one I could possibly think of, because the process, of course, can be very complicated. I've been doing it myself with people since 1975, with a total of maybe 635 people, unless I lost count already. The same basic process that I do. Um, let's say I have a dream. I dream that uh, uh, there's a tree and there's a, a cloud. All right? Couldn't be simpler. Um, so the first, the dream work process, is very, in principle, is very simple. A. Say the dream in the present tense. B. Pick out the images and uh, describe them. Uh, in other words, be aware of them and then uh, identify, become the images, uh, become the tree, become the cloud. Set up dialogues between them. The tree talks to the cloud, the cloud talks to the tree. And they say, make a scene basically, like in a theater, with objectives and obstacles. And they get to a crisis, an impasse, just like in a theory of a tragedy. Act three is a big impasse. And then we have the death of egos, just like in a tragedy. Uh, um, so that the new idea, the new conclusion of the dream work or the tragedy or whatever it is, uh, can come out as the final idea. So in other words, some, there's a process, a crisis there where two sides, the two opposites, uh, reach a, a point where there's a void somehow or other between them. And, it, uh, and these two, two sides uh, give up their identities or somehow surrender, uh, get wiped out or somehow or other, they just die, these two points of views die, so that, and then they're incorporated in a synthesis which comes out of that. The two sides come into a, a kind of a higher level synthesis. Uh, so that is, um, and then from that point of view of the final synthesis, which we, in Gestalt therapy is called the existential message of the dream, um, and theologically we call it the word, it's some kind of a message that comes out of all these uh, opposites. Uh, and then you can look back at all the steps you went through, all the different lay, uh, con con conflicts between different sides of your personality, and you could, they make an analogy of peeling the onion, First, you discover that uh, usually it works by associations. You start off with the tree and the, the, the cloud, but the associations lead you more and more to personal images, and by the end of it, if you're lucky, you find you end up working with the, the last hour or so, you'll be working on your relationship to your mother or your father or your, your uh, child or your parent, wife or somebody very important and personal. And then, with your final message at the end, you discover then you can look back at all the different stages and say, uh, hey, you know, it's called, you might call it the wisdom of hindsight. You can look back and uh, from the point of view, that point of view, that, that new point of view, that higher point of view, you might say, more encompassing point of view, somehow illuminates, illuminates, uh, shows the folly of uh, the, those other partial solutions to your problems and, uh, uh, and shows how, on the other hand, shows how there were steps on the way that you needed to go through these stages of the process. Okay, that's dream work. All right. Um, now, how does that tie in with Chekhov? Maybe I should just jump to that right away. So, uh, well, I do want to say something about. Um, well, let me. I'm going to put Chekhov aside in one more minute. I'll, Hope you'll be patient and not uh, push the lead so fast because you say, hey, when's this guy going to get the Chekhov, you know? My objective is to get, get the Chekhov as soon as possible, but I want to get to him in a, in a context which gives us enough uh, intellectual hardware to do justice uh, to what's going on here. All right, so philosophically speaking, the process I just described uh, in a very simple way, uh, as terms of ideas go, it, it's what's called dialectical thinking. Dialectical thinking, it's a, bit, it's a fancy word, and it's very hard to define it. 
but in, a, in one word, in one, in one sense, dialectical thinking is thesis, antithesis, synthesis. You have something or other, some point of view, that's the thesis. Then you get to an opposite point of view, the anti-thesis, the, uh, anti antithesis, the opposite of that. Somehow it goes against it. And then finally, you have a synthesis, synthesis, S-Y-N means together, and thesis you get, so when you bring the, the two sides of the thesis come together in, uh, and two sides of the antithesis are, are encompassed by a new idea that comes out of the struggle, which is called the synthesis. So you have thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Now if you did that again, let's imagine you do a series of those things like you do in the Gestalt therapy process, then each, pro each cycle is another thesis, antithesis, synthesis, but the important thing is that it begins from this, the, uh, the, the synthesis that you just made in the last cycle. So it's a more and more encompassing every time you're including more and more sides of yourself. Okay? Um, now, if you, if you take a, a bunch of uh, these cycle, uh, cycles, think of them as circles, you know, because you're going you're all the time coming back to the same thing of starting with one and getting, then going to the many and going to the, to the synthesis, the one again. In other words, the, the thesis, the one thing, breaks up into the, all these opposites and, uh, and then they're included in the, in, in the, new, the new oneness. And it, so it's the one and the many. So you start off with the one, then you go to the many, then you get to the one in the many. That's the crucial idea. The many and the one. All right? Uh, philosophically, you'll, I'll sometimes use the phrase identity, and then is the oneness, if something identical to itself. This is Hegel's terminology. And then difference, all the opposites, they're different from each other. And then identity and difference is the one and the many again. If you want to think theologically, and this stuff is uh, all kinds of... All kinds of religions are saturated with this kind of thinking. Just take the simple idea of Genesis. One God starts off first day, first second, Genesis. Oneness, it's all him. Or her, if you, <laughs> whatever your trip is. Or it. And then uh, six days, I mean, we get, end up with a gazillion different creatures. That's, that's, the, that's the, the antithesis of the one, of the one is, the, is the many. And then finally on the Sabbath, at the end of the seventh day, the oneness encompasses all the, all the creatures again, and everything, we, can, we have a peaceful state again. The one and the many. God and the world, the world and God, and that's, uh, so God illuminates all the, the creatures on, uh, on the Sabbath. Okay, so that's the basic idea of dialectical thinking, and that's the basic idea of Gestalt therapy, and that's the basic idea of Michael Chekhov. All right? Now, when you read a person like Michael Chekhov, who was a very serious, very meticulous thinker, you need a dictionary. If you don't have a dictionary, you're just plain lazy or dumb. And that's all there is to it. There's no excuse. But with a dictionary, you open up immediately a whole uh, world of, of me deeper meanings in Michael Chekhov. Uh, and I'll go right to examples here. Let's, let's just take off the first sentence in this five hours, now we're starting on his work. He says, every true artist, especially talented actors, bears within himself deeply rooted and often unconscious a desire for transformation, speaking in our theatrical language, a desire for characterization. I'll read that again. Every true artist, especially talented actors, bears within himself, deeply rooted and often unconscious, a desire for transformation, speaking in our theatrical language, a desire for characterization. All right, now, if there ever was a sentence loaded with, with technical jargon, that's it. <laughs> See, the, Michael Chekhov, well, I'm sure he was aware of this. He, he knew his audience of people he was talking to the most of his time were not intellectuals, were not philosophers, and he was basically telling them a lot of the time, you know, get out of your head, get into your feelings, get into your body, and all this stuff. But at the same time, he used words in a very careful, systematic, philosophical way. So let's just pick apart this sentence for a moment here, just to, and I'm not going to haggle and get into it along. This is just a preliminary 
uh, hors d'oeuvre, just to give you an idea of what's coming up here. Every true artist, the word artist, when he says artist, he's talking about a person who thinks dialectically. All right? Whether you like it or not, that's what he means. A person who doesn't think dialectically, a, 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 say a, a music, a, a actor who doesn't think dialectically in terms of uh, the system he's going to lay out for you, is not an artist. He's just a, a hack, a craftsman, what he calls a craftsman, who does a job. That's what he says in, in uh, his lecture here. A craftsman who does a job, in other words, somebody who doesn't think uh, in, in kind of depth that he wants, uh, dialectically, um, like a gestalt therapy client, um, is not an artist. That's simple. I like to go art. The art of the dot theater, uh, 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 acting as an art, is acting as a dialectical experience, like acting like old gestalt therapy. Whether, whether you like it or not, that's my conclusion. Okay? Now, even let's go on. The next word, talented actors. Your talent. What is your talent? That's your dialectic all over again. That's this inner process of uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis is churning all the time. In your experience, and I'm going to explain. I'm going to justify what I'm saying. Please, uh, don't just assume, assume that it, uh, it's a, it's that simple. Okay, okay. So, so we have every true dialectical thinker, especially a, ta a talent a dialectical actor, bears within himself deeply rooted and often unconscious. What does he mean by unconscious? He's talking about awareness. He's talking about this, uh, awareness, like a stroke therapy. Uh, Fritz Perls talks about awareness. The sub, you notice the word is often, oh, here it is, unconscious. Well, I don't think he's talking about Sigmund Freud here, uh, that kind of unconscious, because he's talking about things that you can right away tune into in your experience. Uh, for example, these, what he calls these um, sensations or atmospheres, all that stuff. That's not buried in your deep, dark Freudian uh, uh, conscious that you'll never discover it unless you... You have to have some psychiatrist sit there and tell you what's going on. No, these are things you as an actor or as a person uh, could just find them by yourself. So that he's, he, that, that, that's what he means by unconscious. Desire for transformation. Now, there's a loaded word if there ever was one. Transformation. What You're transforming yourself from yourself to a character. So we need to have the word character and the word transformation and interlocked here. So let's look at them both. The background here is got to be theological. If you think of uh, Jacob's Ladder, you think of a stack of these dialectical experiences, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and then one after the other, as somebody climbs a ladder from a state of, uh, uh, of sin up to the state of uh, the Messiah or something, this whole trip, whole spiritual uh, journey, Think of it as a stack of pancakes, or think of it as a helix. It's a helix, because every time it's a circle, that, that uh, begins another circle. Uh, and they, they are constantly growing, each a bigger envelope, encompassing the next envelope, the previous envelope. Okay? Um, in, the, in the old days, in the Middle Ages, they, call, they didn't call it transformation. Well, maybe they did call it transformation. I haven't read every book. But the book that I read... If you want to check me out, uh, my main source was Copleston's History of Philosophy, Volume 2, about the Middle Ages. Then you're going to find that the, script, the word they used was tra 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 translation. Translation. And it's interesting, Walter Benjamin, when he wrote an essay about translation, he applied it to contemporary poetry. He used the sense of translation, that it's an ascent from one level to the next of the dialectical process, uh, ever, ever uh, you know, more and more richer, richer, richer. So this desire for an ascent using a dialectical process of endless thesis, antithesis, synthesis, endless, endless cycles of the dialectic. And that's, he's saying that every actor has this desire. Now, certainly this, <laughs> if, you ask, if you ask an actor, do you have a desire for a dialectical uh, transformation or a, no, no, one, no one's gonna know what you're talking about. But Michael Chekhov, he uses these words in a very careful technical sense, and I'm gonna, if you stick around long enough, uh, it might take five videos, I don't know. I hope I'll justify what I'm saying here. And so find out a desire for uh, uh, transformation. So let's go back and take the sentence again. Every 
true artist, especially a talented actor, bears within himself, deeply rooted and often unconscious, a desire for a transformation, in other words, translation, moving up Jacob's ladder, uh, speaking in our theatrical language, a desire for characterization. Now, he's, he says theatrical language, but he's throwing, now he's throwing at you some Aristotle. Right? Where else he got it from? I don't know. He got it from Stanislavski. He got it from his, his, his brother-in-law. I don't know where he got it from. But the word characterization. Look at the dictionary. What does it mean? Camera sign. To engrave. To engrave. To mark something. Uh, now, that's a very deep meaning here. And think of Aristotle's, the idea of, if you read the theory of tragedy uh, of Aristotle, character is action in concrete situation, circumstances. It's an action. He's talking about an action. So he's saying that an, act, an actor has an unconscious need for action. But he doesn't mean action in the sense of going around, running around to all day long making a buck. Or trying to get gigs on in Broadway. No, he's not talking about that kind of action. He's talking about a different sense of action, different kind of motion. Um, so I think it's important. Well, again, at the risk of uh, overloading your 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 uh, <laughs> your attention here, I'm going to risk another one. Uh, I've to repeat something I've said a number of times in other videos, and that is by. In Aristotle, you find it uh, there, and then Ar Imonides brought it into Judaism in the Guide for the Perplexed, this is the second part. He gives 26 principles from Aristotle. And number 13 is this exactly this idea of uh, what we call action in uh, ca character as action in concrete circumstances. Um, Aristotle makes distinction between two kinds of motion. There's uh, motion from point A to B, linear motion. That's not the motion he's talking about. He's talking about motion in a circle and in one place. We just talked about motion in a circle in one place. That's the, the circle of the dialectical process. Thesis, synthesis, synthesis, on and on and on. In the Middle Ages, they called it May angels. Each, each moment of the, the process, each uh, force there, each... Uh, opposite is, is another angel fighting with another angel and uh, the, as they get higher and higher and higher and more and more encompassing more encompassing including more and more angels they become archangels and what's his name here is going to give us uh, uh, we're going to hear from, from Michael Checker pretty soon talk about archetypes he's talking about archangels except he's using he's using jargon that that's uh, that's uh, possible for most actors to grasp, okay? So, let's see, where are we so far? So, let's take, we get back, back to that sentence. We have the idea that every uh, dialectical uh, uh, artist, especially dialectical actors, bears with him deeply rooted and often uh, unaware, not with awareness, a desire for transformation, or in other words, ascent in the cycle of, in the cycle of, uh, uh, moving up, uh, what, 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 by the way, Aristotle calls it local motion. Local motion is in one place and going in the cycle and getting totally involved in the circumstances of that situation. And that's exactly what happens in, in, in a beat of a, of, a, of a moment of a play. You know, an actor gets involved totally in the situation, being totally involved in the situation, um, is what he's talking about here. Uh, so, a desire, deeply and often an unconscious, a desire for transformation, in other words, ascent in, in this local motion process, uh, speaking in our theatrical language, a desire for characterization, for action in concrete situation, which is exactly this idea of local motion, being, being in motion locally, in other words, exactly in your place, in your place where you are at this moment, at that beat of the, of the, of the scene. To be in motion. Now, what is, and it ties in with the idea of emotion. E dash motion. Okay? Is motion, uh, again, emotion as a movement. And that's, that's the sense he's going to use it here. He's going to talk about emotion, love, and all that stuff. 
And that's, a, a, for example, emotion is, a, a, love is expanding. It's emotion, it's emotion, which is a movement of the soul in one place, uh, by being totally involved in the situation you're involved in, then you experience emotions. And that's what he, he contrasts that kind of emotion, which, which you, with sentiment, uh, you know, superficial emotion. So this, you, see, you get a, begin to get a feeling here, unless you're totally lost and you've pushed the lead already, uh, of how, how deep this guy is going if you begin to penetrate. And I haven't seen anybody on the internet I've seen some wonderful examples of uh, trained seals doing all kinds of physical stuff and sounding very emotional and very uh, this and very that, but I haven't seen anybody come close to fathoming what the guy's talking about. He, this physical stuff. He keeps saying over and over again that athletic training for an actor is not what an actor needs. You need it, of course, but the, 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 the psychology needs to be running the show. The body needs to be the servant of the of the uh, psychology. Or well, what is psychology? Again, a word a person like like uh, Michael Chekhov doesn't throw around the word psych psychology lightly. Psych, psyche, soul, mind, soul, spirit. So the spirit, the soul, all these uh, juicy uh, theological terms are what are what 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 the main what runs the process here, and that's all dialectical thinking whether you like it or not. Um, and the body needs to serve that, okay? That's what a psychophysical psycho, uh, uh, exercise is. And I'm going to demonstrate that when we get to one, one after the other. Uh, I don't know if I'll get to all of them, but I'll, I'll try to do a few of them anyway. And psychological gesture and all that stuff. We're talking about dialectical thinking, we're talking about philosophy, we're talking about Kabbalah. If you start translating this stuff into Jewish terminology, you end up with uh, the, the Kabbalah right out of the, the, the Chabad, the Lubavitcher Tanya, or you run right out of the Likutei Moran from, from, uh, from Nachman Bresov. Again, I'll come back to that later, but let me just give you a little bit of an example here, okay? Um, for example, the idea in dream work, in the Gestalt therapy dream work, you're supposed to first see the images, I see a cloud, okay? In the, the collected essays of Nachman Abressa, the first essay, he says that we, we need to uh, find the inner idea in each thing. Now, what do we do in Gestalt therapy? We play, act, become, identify with that cloud. And I, as the cloud, I begin to talk about my existence and how I felt. How do, I, how do I feel being in the cloud, and then what do I want from, from the tree, and all that stuff. And I found the inner idea of the, of, of, of the uh, cloud. And, and that's what uh, Chekhov was asking us for. He, let's see, what does he say here? Uh, mm, identify with the face, the body, the costume, the caricature, the cartoon. Identify with all these different aspects of this image you're looking at. If you put on the face of... Uh, you know, so the cop at the, the standing on the street corner, you take it, take his face, and right away pretend, say, "I'm a cop." You're doing just what any five-year-old can do, and I'm the cop. And he takes out his his uh, toy gun, and he, he's the cop, and he goes running around the running around the the house. Okay, it's the same idea. It's that simple. It's child's play. Uh, but it's also. Uh, very profound stuff. It's dialectical thinking, it's gestalt therapy, it's, it's what it, play therapy, whatever you want to call it. All right. Again, atmospheres. When you, he's asking you to find the general atmosphere of the play, you know? Now, what is that? When you do a dream work, one of the first things you do when you work, let's say you have a dream of a, of, a, of a tree and a cloud. One of the first things uh, uh, most therapists will ask you to do is play the whole scene that you see. So if, I, if there's a tree, a cloud and a tree, I see a field, right? Let, let's say, assume I, I don't see anything else right now. So then I say, I'm this field, and I have in me a tree, and I have in me a cloud, and, uh, and I, I, look, I can look at this more, I can imagine I see blue sky, I can imagine I see lots of clouds, and I can imagine I see lots of, maybe you know, some, some other tree off in the distance there, and then I could say, and then the therapist said, well, was, and I asked, well, how do you feel being this, this field? And I said, oh, I feel so peaceful being this uh, wonderful field here. 
And then uh, the therapist might ask you, well, what happened if all of a sudden comes along a, a lightning storm? Oh, well, it doesn't matter. You know, I just get wet and then I dry out. You know, I, I, I'm cool. So I found a part of myself just now, identified, I discovered a part of myself that somehow can weather the storm. And I asked myself, what does it have to do with my present life? Well, I say to myself, okay, here I am in, living in this town of Safed here, where I've been here half a year. And there ain't, ain't one damn soul in <laughs> so far. That takes me seriously. There was one guy, but he left town. I worked with him a little bit. And I could say, oh my God, that's like, that's like a lightning storm in a, in a field, you know? And, and I say to myself, well, but look at this. Here I am making a video about Michael Chekhov. I found a way to just let it go by and not phase me. I found something else to do with my energy. You know, maybe I'll go to New York. I don't know what I'll do. So I can identify with the field, identify with it. I found some way. Now, if I, if I wanted to play the field as a character in a, in a show or something, well, what kind of a field would I play? Would I play a field with, with all kinds of stiff grass in it? I can't get up here because I can go this high. But I could play a peaceful field where I can weather the storm. Da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. I feel rather uh, energetic and uh, like that. Um, Okay, so um, I just uh, I got distracted right now. I heard some about something out there. I have a lovely studio. It's it's not almost soundproof, but not quite soundproof. So I get it conscious every once, self conscious every once in a while. Anyway, so where was I? I don't want to stop the video. I want to keep going. Um, I got another about half an hour on this tape. So I think I dealt with the first I the first sentence. Alright? Again, every true artist, especially talented actors, bears within himself deeply rooted and often unconscious a desire for transformation. Speaking in our theatrical language, a desire for characterization. Okay, and so now the point I hope I've justified it is to say that he's uh, basically describing the same process that a, a person that comes to a gestalt therapist wants. He wants to grow. He wants to transform himself. He wants to move up, ascend to a higher level of wisdom, the, to have some encompassing ideas, wi wisdom, or emotional experiences, which will allow him to look back at his, his the, 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 the tsuras in his life, the troubles in his life, and and uh, somehow or other uh, find some uh, satisfaction. I just, in fact, I just did that now. My little dream work thing. Um, I found a way to deal with, cope with the, my situation here in, in Sfat, Safed here, all right, through the dream work. So uh, I did a, a, a bit of this uh, process of transformation, uh, uh, translation, moving up to the next higher cycle of the, uh, until the next, <laughs> the next tourist comes along. All right. Um, all right. So let's now go on and uh, Start, let's see, did I deal with the major points, introductory points? Uh, let me just, looking at this overview here that I have of uh, five hours of lecture that I'm going to plow through, at least a certain amount of it anyway, I noticed that the first five of the ten sections, the first five of the, there, basically there are nine sections, the tenth one I just had the exercises, so there are nine sections. The first five of them are dealing in a, co in a cognitive way, We're dealing with what we call awareness. And then in the sixth one, when he starts talking about awakening artistic feelings, um, he's dealing with love, sensations, he's focusing on feelings, emotions, and then, then he has those five guiding principles, kind of summarizes things. And then in the Latin, number eight, he talks about overcoming inhibitions. So there he's dealing with what uh, gestalt therapists would call uh, self-interruptions. You know, in gestalt therapy, there are five major kinds of self-interruptions. There's confluence, introjection, projection, retroflexion, egotism. Uh, maybe I should define those things right now because they'll, be keep, they'll keep coming up in our work. Confluence, the root is, the Latin root is con with, fluere, to flow, to flow with. In other words, you're stuck, you're flowing with your habits. You're like an autistic child that doesn't want to be bothered by, or is afraid to deal with anything that's not exactly 
in his little tiny world there. He's an empty fortress, the way Bruno Bettelheim uh, talked about it. Uh, slave to habits, rituals, okay? Confluence. Next, if you're a little healthier than that, then you're a, li you're a little more open to awareness experiences, then uh, you, you're, you might be possessed by an introject, a dibuk in other words. Let's say you have some very authoritarian parent that uh, taught you uh, to be a, uh, basically to be a slave and, that, and, not, and to think what he thinks or what she thinks instead of what you'd like to think and feel what you like to feel. So that's called interjection. Intro in, jectare, to throw. You've thrown in or swallowed some big, big authority figure. Interjection. Projection, jectare again. You've thrown out, pro, you throw, pro is forward. You throw forward some part of yourself and you, uh, for example, your regression. Instead of you using your regression, you assume people want to attack you, or if you're a woman, you might think people want to rape you uh, and not own your own up to your own sexuality. So that's a, a little healthier. It's healthier than an introject, but not, not that healthy. Next, retroflexion. If you're still even healthier than that, and you've got lots of energy coming out, but instead of letting it out, you turn it back in, and you become a kind, of, kind of a compulsive person <coughs> doing all kinds of repetitive rituals with your body. I'm sure there are a lot of actors uh, in that type that, uh, that uh, live in these uh, physical theater workshops, and their whole life is just one, one warm-up exercise after another. And, uh, and that substitutes for action, all right? Being a trained, trained monkey is, is still not being a human being. Because if you don't find a way to, to, to move beyond the body, okay? And the rituals. All right, and then finally egotism, that's uh, the healthiest one, it's where you have this frozen image of who you think you are. And, uh, you're all set to grow, and all of a sudden you hold yourself back. Well, wait a second. I mean, for example, right now, <laughs> I'm thinking, hey, I really belong in, in New York, you know? Like, I'm a bridge between the Hasidim of Brooklyn and the, and the theater world of Manhattan. But then I say to myself, oh, but wait a second. How, I don't know. I couldn't handle that. That may be too difficult. And uh, how am I going to pay the rent? And uh, maybe I should stay here in Swat and read a book the rest of my life, the way, the way my ex-wife wants me to do. Just be, be, pretend I'm an old man, uh, but, but, but I tell her, hey, wait a second, I feel like an adolescent. Okay, anyway, so <clears throat> those are the five self-interruptions, and he calls them overcoming inhibitions. <coughs> he says inhibitions are a family connected, of course, <coughs> because they're all part of this dialectical system. All different ways of interrupting the process of thesis, antithesis, synthesis at different, at different points. For example, if you're confident, the process never gets started because you're not aware of anything. All right. Um, okay, so we talked, uh, I just gave you an overview of, <coughs> of the five hours. So now we start off the, the first, first five sections. It's mostly cognitive stuff about, but I say, now we have to make a distinction between what, what I mean by cognitive. I certainly don't mean thinking about life, but, uh, what in Gestalt therapy they call aboutism or elephant shit. No, I'm, thinking of, I'm talking about awareness. Aware, the Gestalt uh, jargon would be awareness. Uh, uh, very rarely do I find in, in uh, Michael Chekhov the word awareness. So what does he use instead of awareness? So let's see if we can find it here. Let's start off with the first section. There are four means of assuming a characterization. Now, right away, jargon word assuming. In other words, to assume something is to, the way he's using the word here, is to identify with it. You want to identify with, with some character out there. So you're, it's like you're dreaming this character, but you don't know what you're dreaming of. You're making up the dream as you're as you're doing the process, you know. Um, by the way, this, this flashes into a very nice connection to the Nachman Abresov is the idea that the, uh, this is exactly what uh, the, uh, the Tzadi, the, the, the wise man does. He, he first creates, the, but I, I, I'm going to get distracted, but I'll come, I'll come back to it some other time. Okay, but anyway. Okay, so how does, Nach, how does uh, Bres, uh, Michael check? How does he deal with the idea of awareness? He's got, he's, he's got to deal with awareness. But he doesn't want to sound psychological. 
So he tells you to, he gives you four things to do. Imagine his character and imagine the, the see this, this image, okay? And you want to imagine there's a body out there. See, right away you see a body. Just like you do in dream work. I saw a tree, I saw a, a cloud. And so here I see a body of a character, but it's amorphous so far. And I want to imagine the, uh, the, the character. Let's say I read the script and I have a vague idea about the character. Let's say the character is, uh, uh, I want to make up a character, just make up some kind of a character. Let's say the character is, uh, um, uh, i got to find something that's ca character. Ink block, okay? The ca I'll call a character ink block. So I see my ink block character out there, okay? I'll make it totally uh, a projection. And I want to ask myself, how is my mind, I, I want to compare myself and notice differences between my mind and my inkblot character out there, okay? And then I want to compare the feelings of the inkblot character and the will of the inkblot character to my own will, my own feelings, my own mind, okay? So, for example, I see this inkblot out there, and I notice that this inkblot character somehow or other spreads all over the place. And, I said to myself, well, I'm different than that because I'm able to focus, even though I'm spreading all over the place like he does, still I'm able to focus and try to zero in on trying to say something uh, particular here. <laughs> it might not sound like it. It might sound like more, more like an inkblot ink than I'd like to, but still. So there's a difference. Now what did I do when I, when I made that difference? I established a, what in Gestalt therapy, they call a contact boundary. See, in the state of confluence, Everything is one, the oneness. You know, this, this kid in his, in, in, in playing with his uh, rituals there, you know, with, with his, maybe with his erector set and just locked into his, his whole life as the erector set or something like that, you know, making little kinky little things or drawing kinky little pictures. For him, that's sameness. That's, that's a safe world that's always the same and not going to be threatened by any, anything or anybody. Um, So when I see the inkblot and see that, say that I, I'm more focused than this inkblot character out there is, I'm seeing a difference. And when I see a difference, I'm, I'm, I've already freed myself from confluence. I move one level up, all right, I'm more, uh, uh, in awareness, and now I have a contact boundary between me and something else, between me and the inkblot. That's awareness. I've established a contact boundary. There, and this is the, one of the basic ideas here of contact and awareness. Very important. Uh, when I let's take it from Aristotle, okay? I, I, I don't know where where in Aristotle I read it, but somewhere the idea there are two birds. If I look out there and see my inkblot character, it's as though the inkblot character is is a, is a bird comes from that him or her towards me, and my from here, like Moses has horns, I, I radiate out. Uh, uh, Awareness also, and they meet in the middle. And the two image, the the, the 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 awareness moment from the from the ink blot and the awareness moment from Franklin meet there at that point, and they have an orgasm, believe it or not, just like Adam and Eve. Adam knows Eve. Franklin knows the org, uh, the ink blot. That's the idea of a contact contact moment. There's a living experience at that moment. And in the Kabbalah. They have Chochma Bina. They have the two highest points of view, and, and Chochma is wisdom, and Bina is, is building or something. Or, so it's subject and object. So the subject and the object, each one sends out a bird, they meet in the middle, they, they connect somehow or other. There's a moment of living experience there, and they have a, symbolically speaking, Adam knows Eve, Franklin knows the inkblot, uh, whatever it is, and the this is the idea of love also that's, that's uh, so basic. Contact boundary as love. And that's when he's raving about love here and how important it is and the basis of all feelings. What's the basis of all feelings? Contact, re uh, relationship, awareness with something else. You can't feel something if you don't contact the thing. You can't, if you're not in contact and awareness with your body awareness, how are you going to love anything? And uh, if you don't have any imagination to, uh, to allow your imagination to, to fly with the love relationship, again, there's no love. So the, the awareness, uh, the moment of awareness, contact, is, is the basis of love, and it's the basis of uh, 
or the, the cognitive thing at the same time. So seeing the differences in the feelings within the, in the will and the mind and the think plot in me is establishing a contact boundary, okay? The first step in, in, in giving objectivity to that new character that you're creating. Because otherwise, the character remains... Remember, he keeps telling us, don't just play your everyday self. And unless you establish... Don't just be your subjective self. You need to find an, a, a, an objective self out there. The character is something objective, not, not your own just your own habits. It's not just a, don't just make self-portraits of your uh, in, in all your characters. You need to all the time find objectivity. That you're creating something new out there. You're seeing something new. You're contacting something that's different from you. So the first step is finding differences. Okay, and that's what we just did. Next, finding centers. When I play the, when I see the, the cloud out there, I play the cloud. Oh, I'm this cloud. Okay, I'm a cloud. So where's my center? Maybe it's in my fingers at that moment when I'm uh, feeling like a, a free, free wispy cloud. But maybe if I feel if I'm a cloud that's that's ready to have lightning, then ah, maybe my center is down there somewhere, or, or in my toe, uh, my rear end. I don't know. The center depends on the action that's going on. All right. So when you identify with something, part of it is finding the center from where you're identifying. If I'm the tree, I could identify with the leaves, I could identify with the trunk, I could identify with the roots, I could identify with the whole tree, anything I want. You know, I could pick a worm in the tree and then that could be my center. Whatever, I could be a, 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 the radiance of the flowers from the tree. And my center might be a big, uh, uh, wispy, uh, uh, filigree uh, five meters away from the tree, whatever it is. Or, or... So again, it's just like the Gestalt therapy process of finding the center of that, that object that I projected, that I created, okay? Imaginary body, same thing, right? The imaginary body of the cloud, imaginary body. And then he says, get up and play the cloud. So I can't get up here, but I can, I can be a cloud. I can put myself my body on the image of the cloud I just created, and that's Gestalt therapy, just like it's uh, Michael Chekhov. And finally, list of business, I think of all the things that, uh, in the play, that's exactly parallel to all different steps in my Gestalt therapy process that led up to my final uh, moment of uh, aha, enlightenment, uh, existential message, whatever it is, that allowed me with the wisdom of hindsight to look backwards, so by walking through all the, the business uh, uh, and letting my body, do the, the imaginary body do that and letting the centers be involved and letting all the, everything else be involved, more and more I'm identifying with this, this overall action, what they call, now here's a very important uh, label here, to stay, the process of the Gestalt therapy working from one pair of opposites to the next pair of opposites, the next cycle of dialectic, next cycle of dialectic, you know, for starting off working with, for example, gains, games people play, you know, being the crybaby, being the, the pompous ass piece of shit game, being the, the tragedy queen, all these different games that Fritz Perls talks about. So we, in our Gestalt therapy work, we, 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 most of us go, uh, we discover that we are somehow uh, uh, involved in those kind of habitual patterns and one by one we uh, peel away the onion of uh, our ego crud. Um, so each of those stages of contacting one of those oppositions is another bit of business. And uh, the, the entire sequence is called, by Hegel, I think it's, I got the terminology from Hegel, it's called an objective history. It's a history of things you do objectively. Because you see yourself doing, if you're doing your stroll therapy properly, when you, when you catch yourself doing the, the crybaby game and you look at yourself out here and talk to yourself as the crybaby, when I talk to myself as the crybaby, you know, I get objectivity and then I'm in the here and now and I can decide do I want to continue to be a crybaby or do I want to maybe uh, grow up a little bit and stop crying so much and start taking care of responsibility for my own life. Okay, so you see how every stage here of the four means of assuming characterization fits right into the Gestalt therapy process of work, beginning, basic beginning work on the dream. All right? It couldn't be obvious. Okay. Now we get to the next one. How much time we got left? We got another, I don't know if all the time to get finished this or not. Well, how about, it, uh, before I get to that, ah, all right, we, we, uh, we can jump over here and a couple of other things that fit into that query, then I'll, then I'll come back later. 
Because now we're getting ready for the deal with the uh, mass of the character and many leveled acting, the second section. But I'm going to skip for now the idea of exhaling and inhaling, and I'll just go. He, he mentions a few other things here you could do that are uh, basically simple here. Uh, remember, we talked about the. Uh, so you could think, he talks about atmospheres. Oh, before that, in, the face, the body, the costume, the caricature, the cartoon, different things you could identify with for your character. Uh, you could go, uh, imagine your character is like somebody you know, and then you could copy that person's face, uh, just like in a digital therapy session, where you, you know you're going to play a relationship between you and your mother. So you want to uh, stand up and uh, or you want to take on the, as much, much as you can the the body and the voice, raise your, your voice uh, probably. And I have to shrink myself down because my mother was small. If I think of my mother now at age 103, the last time I saw her when she was going to die, before she died, you know, she was basically a bag of bones. And if I think of myself as a bag of bones with a very weak voice, you know, and I have this very sad feeling because I'm looking at, ah, Franklin, I'm, uh, I want to help you do well in Israel, Franklin. And I felt miserable uh, leaving her behind there, <laughs> going to Israel. Uh, Okay, but identified by, by shrinking myself and feeling like a bag of bones and finding that weak voice, um, I found a, an important uh, uh, psychological center. Or, 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 in fact, I would say that's a good PG for me, uh, psychological gesture. I found a connection with psychology in my body. Uh, that voice and, that, that and all the love and all the pain involved in that. Okay. So identify with the face, body, costume, caricature. All right, all, uh, all of those things are obvious. Okay, you just pick, pick. You start off with just kind of throwing your ideas around your imagination. And by the way, what does he mean by imagination? Oh, well, that's another million-dollar word. We'll come back to that in a minute. Also, uh, I guess I might not get to that till the next second tape here. All right, so then another thing he wants you to identify with is the atmosphere. The atmosphere. Now, what's the difference between an atmosphere of the play and the super objective of the play? That's a good one. It took me a while to figure that one out. Now, the word atmosphere, again, you need a dictionary to deal with Chekhov. You open atmosphere. What does it mean? What is the root? Atmos means what? Soul. <laughs> of course, soul. What is sphere? A sphere is obvious, a sphere. Think of Aristotle. A sphere in which all, every point is the center. A sphere in which every point is the center. That's the idea of uh, 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 Aristotle's idea of an organism. Like the body is a, is a sphere in which every point is the center. And if you identify, right, let's say I have a pain in my liver right now, and if I identify, my focus of be, my being is in that liver, so that liver becomes the, the center of, the, of that sphere. And uh, right now, I'll say I have a headache, I actually have a little bit of a headache, or an itch, then that itch becomes the center of my being. That becomes the focus. So a sphere, an endless sphere, a world, an organism, like a big amoeba, that which every, <coughs> every point <coughs> is the center. <coughs> so that's the idea of atmosphere. <coughs> He's talking about some kind of an idea, <coughs> exactly what you have in additional therapy where every point can become the center of the dream. The, tree, the, the focus of the, dream, of, the, of the dream work at this moment could be the cloud, or the focus of the dream work at this point could be the, the tree, or, the, or the, the ground, the roots of the tree and the ground, or the, any, the sky, or the sun, or uh, God running the whole show or something, whatever you want to, what trip you, whatever you trip you into. And these, each of those is another atmos, another soul in this big sphere. So if you ask yourself now, what's, this, what's the atmosphere of the whole play? Well, basically you're doing like a good, but you're doing it before you do your dream work. This is a preliminary exercise. So if you just read the play, you know, uh, my inkblot play, you know, uh, and I read about it, I have a superficial idea of, of how all the different start, things that are going to happen to this inkblot, uh, how, 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 they, how they all might relate to each other in some, just some kind of a fairy tale idea. And that'll give me a general, general atmosphere of the whole, uh, the story of the life of this inkblot. But that's not the super objective. The super objective is after you've done all the work, after you spent your three hours sweating out 
the, uh, the relationship, I'll say I'm on a dream here, uh, after I've worked on the associations from the, from the cloud to, and then and the Shri, then I get to an association of my dog, a died, and, and, uh, and an association to, to my mother maybe, okay, I just got through with that, and five other associations, and when I, when I sweat my way through, struggle my way through all of that, I get my final um, existential message of the dream work, that's the super objective. The super, the over idea that was like a magnet pulling me towards the the, the final uh, conclusion, what uh, what uh, Aristotle would call the uh, the final cause. So the final cause of the uh, super objective is not the general atmosphere of the play. The general atmosphere is the, when you first look at it. It's it's a working of it's a first approximation. And in fact, if you hold, if you think of this whole process here as integral calculus. You're getting with success or approximation. You're closing in with your imagination, with your awareness, with your projections and all this stuff and imaginary con contact boundary that you make. You're closing in more and more, uh, or at the same time you're closing in, you're also expanding uh, your, your world that, that this whole play is opening up for you. Projecting more and more of your personality into the different elements. Okay, so it's, is that clear? I hope that the uh, difference between the atmosphere, general atmosphere of the show that you use as a, 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 as a, a kind of an envelope to encompass a lot of the, the specific things you'll do later on. Let's say, if, maybe pin it down more particularly here. I don't know how much time. I got, I got about another. Oops. Well. Eh. Let's say this dream work here with the with the, the tree in the cloud. Okay, I, I got the general idea. Oh, the field. We got to the field already. We got to this field of uh, this uh, field that which is um, able to overcome obstacles. That's my kind of uh, uh, identification with the overall message. So that's my pre preliminary maybe idea of the atmosphere, of general atmosphere of the dream. But if I spend three hours now working on that simple relationship between the tree and the, and the cloud, then the super objective I'll get at the end will be much more profound because the, 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 I have gone so many more cycles. I've, I've got to work my way up from angels to archangels on my uh, Jacob's Ladder, on my uh, uh, helix of uh, the beats of the dialectical process here, thesis and this is a synthesis over and over again. I've gone deeper and deeper into the here and now situation, the, the local motion, emotion, motion as moving the, of the soul deeper and deeper into the here and now until you get to the messianic now. Okay, so that's the difference between the, the general atmosphere and, and the super objective. Okay, and the same thing with the character. Um, you can uh, look at the whole life of the character at the beginning and have a general idea about the character. Watch what he does, his whole thing, you know. Um, Think of some show, Hamlet, think of some show, uh, anything. You can take some dumb show on TV and just, just look at that overall action and, and let that be the uh, particular atmosphere. Until you get into working with each of those images and, and uh, by identifying and working on the, all the oppositions into the void each time and finding the new ideas, all that stuff, the negations of the negations, uh, where you, the ego dies each time and is reborn with a higher point of view. So before you work through that, you can have a general idea about the character. A, a particular atmosphere for this character. That's an atmosphere, but it's still not the superjective of the character. All right? It's individual because it's focused on the character, but it's nothing like the, the superjective. All right, so we've covered everything, all the major points here except exhaling and inhaling. Uh, and we'll get to that. Uh, I don't have time now, but I'm, I hope you'll stick around for the, for the next chapter of this, uh, this endless odyssey here. <laughs> I don't know how far I'll go with this, but so far I feel all right. All right, this is, uh, again, this is tape number one about not Mike, Michael Chekhov, the master classes, which, by the way, the subtitle of that thing is called On Theater and the Art of Acting, and I hope you'll see it on the internet, five hours there, if you have patience to listen to every word. And uh, it's a beautiful workbook. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, and uh, hope to see you again. Bye-bye.